Welcome, I am Matt Kloon, your host today, a SAMHSA Public Health Advisor and a person in long-term recovery. During this program, we will discuss the current opioid epidemic in America. We'll look at the federal, state, and local programs that are effectively addressing this issue. Our panel of experts today will speak about creative strategies being utilized around the country that are helping to tackle this widespread problem and what critical next steps communities can take. Joining in our panel today is Spencer Clark, a public health advisor, Division of Pharmacological Therapies, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. Mayor Steve Williams, the mayor of Huntington, West Virginia, who some consider to be the ground zero for the opioid epidemic. Evan Figueroa of Argus is the program manager for the Mental Health Partnerships, PureNet Homeless Specialty in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And lastly, we are joined by Dr. Charmaine Yost, Director of External Affairs at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Dr. Yost, I'd like to turn to you about this. What exactly are opioids um, for, for the public's knowledge, and why are they typically prescribed, and what are the risk factors? Matt, I'm really glad that you started with that question because one of the biggest problems that we're facing right now in the opioid crisis is what we're calling an information underload. People don't really fully understand what it is we're confronting with the crisis. Opioids are pain medication that are derived from the poppy plant, and they've been around for millennia. Mm -hmm. But we've seen an explosion in prescriptions of opioids over the last couple decades when we had a trend that changed in America towards seeing pain as the fifth vital sign. Mm -hmm. So doctors started, um, started prescribing it more and more, and Americans didn't necessarily realize that this was a trend and that it was something that they needed to be paying close attention to. You know, we think about opioids, probably most people know that something like morphine is an opioid. But when you go to the dentist and you have a tooth taken out and they give you Percocet, Right. That's an opioid. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing situations like where a doctor will give someone after a dental procedure 30 Percocet. Well, you might not necessarily need quite that many Percocet given the fact that it does have addictive qualities. And what we're seeing now in terms of the epidemic mm -hmm. and the fact that why the president has declared this a public health emergency is we're seeing over 115 people a day 115 people a day in America dying from this. So imagine if we had a, a small airplane crash every single day in America, Thanks. what our reaction would be. Thank you so much for, for that. Spencer, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, op opioid misuse and how that sometimes trends into opioid use disorder. The type of patient that Dr. Yost spoke of, they, they may be, be beginning to use it uh, on the basis of a, a prescription from a physician to treat a a pain condition, and find over a period of time that uh, the, their use has become a de dependent use where they are using more than was prescribed by the physician or for a longer period of time, and they're beginning to have other effects. Uh, their they're, they're withdrawal effects when they are not using, uh, they are, it begins to interfere with other parts of their lives, uh, their cravings. Uh, other conditions uh, interfering with life responsibilities. And that's, in, in, in short order, addiction is when a, a condition is interfering with life functions that we all are responsible for. Home, school, family, uh, relationships, all those things. And addiction interferes with all of those. I'd like to direct our next question to Mayor Williams of Huntington, West Virginia. We all know, layperson professionals alike, that the opioid epidemic has become a become a public health emergency, and we know that you're feeling it um, in your town. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Frankly, this has become such an, such an issue in Huntington. Three years ago, um, I started having individuals writing me, sending me emails, stopping me on the street saying, somebody needs to do something. Mm -hmm. Please, we're, we're losing our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I always thought it was a law enforcement problem. And the long and short of it is, is that we stepped out very aggressively from a law enforcement standpoint mm -hmm. and over a 90-day period um, arrested over 200 people. And frankly, we thought, I was thinking, those guys know not to come in to my town now, mm -hmm. but they just kept coming. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize uh, and understood firsthand that you can't arrest your way out of this, mm -hmm. is that we had a serious... 
uh, problem of addiction in our community that we needed to, to address and that we needed to start focusing on saving lives, harm reduction, getting people towards treatment, uh, creating those opportunities where we got the entire community, the entire community involved. Because frankly, uh, what I keep saying to folks in our community is that every one of us has, has to take ownership of this, everyone. It's an ancient maxim is that if you name it, then you can own it. I like so that. So we named it. Yeah. And said what the problem was. And there are some folks that still don't like the fact that we came out so aggressively and said what the problem was. Mm -hmm. um, but you introduced me earlier that we are the epicenter of the opiate epidemic. We have a little different take on that now in, mm -hmm. in Huntington. Um, we see ourselves as the epicenter of the solution. Perfect. Because this is a very, very complex problem. It, it takes all aspects of the community, all aspects of the state, all aspects of the nation. And when everybody comes to understand what their assignment is, and it's gonna be as unique as every person's personality, mm -hmm. but when everybody takes ownership of this, then we find ourselves on the other side of, of the solution. And I believe that Huntington is so far down the road in, in fighting this. If when we start to whip this, Huntington's gonna be right on the front, front line in I, the first steps of that. Thank you, and I can feel that energy, and I, I, we'd like to dig in a little deeper on uh, some of the solution-focused sure. issues in the next segment. Uh, Dr. Yost, if I might, are you familiar with some of the st statistics, I'm guessing, around uh, how this is impacting the nation on an annual basis in terms of rising numbers of opioid use disorder, rising number of deaths last year? The CDC just came out with numbers. Well, this last year was the first time that deaths from opioid uh, misuse exceeded deaths from breast cancer, exceeded deaths from traffic fatalities. So this is really, really coming home. I'm a breast cancer survivor. When I heard that statistic, I thought that's just amazingly dramatic. Mm. And I don't think, I think that people, you know, Steve makes a really important point that everyone has to become involved because at, at the end of the day, there is, there is a personal decision that mm -hmm. has to be made about mm -hmm. this in terms of parents interacting with their children and educating their children about the fact that you can't take medications from someone you don't know. Um, some of the drug traffickers are now um, making, creating, uh, putting fentanyl, which is a very highly potent opioid, into other things like cocaine and c making these very, very deadly products that sometimes people don't know that they're taking. Right. And so Steve's point about putting together a multifaceted campaign that includes prevention, treatment, and interdiction, decreasing the supply, all of these pieces have to be put in play. And that's why, frankly, the president has put together a, a strategy that includes all three elements of that plan. We know that some folks are more vulnerable to addiction than others. And from my knowledge, I've seen a greater prevalence of opioid use disorder among those with mental health illnesses or disorders or those inclined to addictive disorders. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um some of the uh, challenges is um, barriers to access and mental health services. And as a result, I believe that at times um, individuals end up um, self-medicating themselves as a result, you know, having some mm -hmm. um, challenges. Um, what I see uh, specifically in the Latino community is the, um, there's a language gap or language barrier there. So again, um, with those challenges of accessing um, behavioral health services in, in the city of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, individuals end up um, using um, narcotics to kind of uh, self-medicate. Um, but I also wanted to touch on Steve's um, point about uh, arresting our way out of um, this opiate epidemic. <clears throat> so when we look back to the 80s, 90s, and um, mm -hmm. 2000s, um, yeah. so my brother was uh, addicted to crack cocaine. He was sent off to jail um, on numerous occasions. So he uh, was sent to, um, to jail. He was on house arrest. He was on probation. None of those interventions worked. Um, in fact, um, in early 2000, after doing his uh, last thing in jail, right, he picked up an opiate, heroin addiction mm -hmm. while inside mm -hmm. the prison system. Mm -hmm. Four days later, after he was released from um, uh, jail on New Year's Day of 2002, he actually overdosed um, as a result of an opiate um, 
overdose. So to anyone who tells me that, um, you know, arresting our way out of the opiate epidemic, um, you know, I, I think that's just like, like false. Um, I think uh, we all need to be, uh, we all need to be at the table. So that's faith-based, um, uh, public leaders, um, community members, other stakeholders. And one missing ingredient that I need, that I believe that needs to be at the table is the person with lived experience and the active user. Their mm -hmm. voice needs to be heard as well. I okay. believe the active user yeah. needs to be there. Thank you. When we return, we will discuss the widespread issue of opioid addiction and how all members of our communities are affected. We are a substance abuse and mental health uh, treatment agency that's located in Southern Ohio. Currently now we operate in three counties, which is um, Adams, Lawrence, and Scioto counties. Um, within those counties, we have a wide variety of programming, um, both inpatient and outpatient. Stepping Stones is a small, small part of the Counseling Center, but it's also a very, very important part of the Counseling Center. Uh, Stepping Stones program focuses on women with children, also emphasizes on pregnant women as they uh, go through their addiction-related disorders. Stepping Stones is a residential housing organization for mothers who are expecting and can have an opportunity to bring another child. They're allowed to have two children live in the residential uh, home with them while being pregnant. And then there's an outpatient service that they offer to the mothers who are not ready for residential services, but can receive some counseling on the outside on a regular basis. One of the things that makes Stepping Stones very special and unique is our uh, daycare programming. We allow um, children to uh, enter the program that are uh, 12 years and under. We also have newborn babies here on site, uh, newly born uh, infants that we're very proud of that are also uh, drug free. We offer a education uh, opportunity for those moms, similar to childbirth education. It talks about what they can expect when they come in to deliver. It talks about um, what care them and their baby will be receiving and it kind of alleviates some of their fears. I've been in the Stepping Stones for about 60 days. When I came here, I've made some of the best friends that I probably will ever have. They don't want anything from you except for you to get better. The most important thing that I gained by participating in the Stepping Stone program was an ability to live a different life. And I gained sober sisters. I gained new people in my life that were healthy instead of the unhealthy relationships that I had. We have counselors that are on site. We do individual counseling, mental health, peer support. They offer a lot of different types of recovery paths. Stepping Stones uses a rapid taper program with their medically assisted treatment. Well, through the medication assisted treatment, initially it helps patients with withdrawal symptoms. So it helps alleviate some of those discomforts that they're having in the beginning. It's a tool that we use to keep a client engaged in treatment until their withdrawal symptoms have subsided. In the beginning, the medication is the biggest piece to keep them here. It alleviates the withdrawal symptoms enough for them to be able to go to group, to focus and learn the things that they need to learn to live a sober life. The ability to have children on site along with the mom during treatment, we feel like that that is an opportunity to reduce distraction during the treatment stay. Um, we found out years ago when uh, women came to treatment and they were not allowed to bring their uh, child to treatment, that that was a very distracting process. It also put a lot of burden onto the family. Stepping Stones offer clients housing to couple with their treatments. That takes them out of the environment where they used, that takes them away from old friends that they used with to give them a clean and sober environment to support their recovery efforts. The opioid epidemic over the last decade has really had a huge impact on the Counseling Center and also a huge impact on our local community. Um, what the Counseling Center has done to try to respond to that horrific problem within our community is to try to develop access points for people that need drug and alcohol treatment. The services that Stepping Stones provide to our mothers and to their unborn child in regards to the opioid disease is tremendous. It really gives them a beginning foundation that maybe they didn't have before of coping 
being able to cope with stressors that are around us every day and begin to put into place some of those mechanisms that make them feel like a whole person again. I would recommend Stepping Stone Program to any woman that wants to change her life, any woman that wants to become a mother to their child, anyone that has addiction that doesn't know how to live life without drugs and alcohol. I came into Stepping Stones as um, a mother of three children um, in active addiction. I stayed clean. I stayed around the counseling center, around the sober friends and relationships I had developed in treatment. And I have now earned a master's degree in social work. One of the reasons I've stayed here is because this is one of the best things that's ever happened in my life. This is an amazing program for mothers and children. You might not know everyone in your community, but if you did, you'd see that people in recovery from mental and substance use disorders are all around. Reach out for support and begin your recovery journey. Join the Voices for Recovery. Strengthen families and communities. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referrals for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Hello and welcome back to The Road to Recovery. How does opioid use disorder impact families, communities, and society? I'd like to start out immediately with Dr. Yost of ONDCP and talk a little bit about illicit fentanyl and what role that has to play in the opioid epidemic and opioid overdose deaths specifically. Yeah, Matt, I'm so glad you bring that up because I think it's really important for us to get the information about fentanyl out there, particularly to young people because they don't necessarily know how potent fentanyl is and how the fact that drug traffickers are using fentanyl um, to illicitly lace things that people don't necessarily know that they're getting it. For example, you'll see Xanax, uh, you know, counterfeit Xanax pills mm -hmm. that are laced with fentanyl. As a result, fentanyl is driving the increase that we're seeing in opioid deaths. Mm -hmm. in the most, with the most recent data, we had 42,000 deaths uh, due to opioid in 2016. Ha fully half of those 20,000 deaths were attributable to fentanyl. So um, it's really important for people to be aware of this. And frankly, if you don't mind me picking up on something Steve was saying earlier, sure. I completely agree with you that we can't um, arrest our way out of this problem. Mm -hmm. But we do have to be very, very serious mm -hmm. about the drug drug traffickers who are yep. flooding our country yep. with fentanyl. And that's one of the reasons why the president has been so focused on um, border issues and prosecution issues. Um, uh, Attorney General Sessions recently announced a new program that's looking very comprehensively mm -hmm. at our law enforcement approach to mm -hmm. drug trafficking because we need to be so serious about the potency of this drug. A number of states and cities around the country have been especially effective uh, in their efforts to combat this public health crisis. And I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your own experience in Huntington. Huntington's uh, just shy of 50,000 people. We live in a metro area, about 360,000 people. But if I'm talking to the mayors of Chicago and New York, they're dealing with it exactly the same way that, that we're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Yost pointed out is that when we do have um, fentanyl coming in and heroin coming in from overseas, not just a public health problem, but it's an, I mean, a public safety problem, but it's a national security problem. Exactly. You know, a clear national security problem. But what we have to be able to do where in our communities, we're mm -hmm. dealing with it on, on the ground. Right. Um, what, when we're saving people's lives, uh, Narcan and Naloxone is, is being used to, to try to save people's lives. And there's some jurisdictions that say, no, we're not going to, to, to use that. But frankly, we have to have it just because our public, our, our first responders are at risk. Mm -hmm. But when we save somebody's life, we have to have the opportunity immediately to be able to get them into treatment. So quick response teams are being created around the country. In, in our community, uh, we have uh, uh, mental health specialists, uh, law enforcement uh, officers in plain clothes going within 72 hours after somebody has been has, uh, overdosed that we go to them and start offering to help them get into, mm -hmm. get into treatment. I mean, if, if we truly cherish life as we do, 
Uh, we couldn't dare say just let them die. We don't have we don't have that right. Right. But we also need to save people's lives. But we also need to save people's lives by coming back to them and giving them an opportunity to be able to get their life back on track. Let me pick up on something that Steve and Evan have both mentioned, which is that um, the importance of the personal and connecting with someone where they live. And one of the things that's been most interesting to me in interacting with the amazing scientists that we have working on this issue, um, for example, some of them up at the National Institutes of Health, as they're looking at what works in, in helping people, one of the most um, striking and influential protective factors in dealing with people who struggle with addiction is their level of connection to community. Isn't that striking to you? And so this is one of the reasons that we emphasize building up community. For example, at ONDCP, we have a program called Drug Free Communities, DFC, and it's a grant program. So we give grants to communities as they're building a network at the grassroots level in a community, looking to see how can we put a multifaceted, multi-prong approach together at the ground level in interacting with people. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Evan, I'm so sorry for the loss of your brother. I was stunned to read the statistics on how, what a problem we have with losing prison inmates after they leave prison. And so one of the components of the president's plan in, attack, in attacking the opioid crisis is focusing on prison inmates first as they're coming into the prison system, looking to see better screening to find out what their level of addiction is, um, working with them while they're in prison, but also focusing on them as they're leaving and going back into the community, making sure that they have connections as they leave. So um, really focusing on that, that on the ground level of how do you interact with people at an individual level to get them treatment and into recovery. You did mention so in, in the prisons, I was on the joint opiate task force of city and county officials. And we went uh, to the jail in Kenton County, Kentucky, and they had a separate medically assisted treatment um, program. Mm -hmm. The recidivism rate of individuals that came out of that prison was less than 10%. Right. Less, than 10, less than 10%. The judge executive who I was talking to at, at the time indicated, what, what do you need in a treatment program? You need a building, you need beds, uh, you need staff, Guess what? We already have those. Mm -hmm. Those are called prisons. And those individuals are in there for a specified period of time. You can't make them go into it, but once they go in voluntarily into the medically assisted treatment and receive the medical assistance, right. but also the counseling that, that goes, they start to develop their own life skills. Mm -hmm. This is, where, this is where within that community and then out in the community. Right. What we try to say, take my hand a second here. Now, try to let go. Try to let go. What we try to say to anybody who is in recovery is that we are never going to let go. Okay. We're Absolutely. always going to hold on. They can the depend of upon of us in the community to stand around them. That's why that works when it's community-based. So how do we f facilitate reentry and how do we make sure that folks exiting uh, prison have exactly. all the tools that they need. Spencer, I'm wondering, um, I know that SAMHSA has a number of different programs and grantees that are uh, specifically um, community-based, uh, are coming up with uh, some of the best innovations come out of our communities. And I wonder if you might just pluck one or two that are addressing these Yes, uh, the, the, the two on. that we've already referenced, I think one that's the most exciting is working with patients in the emergency room. Patients that are experiencing overdoses that are being intervened with by medical professionals, having uh, trained counselors or peers that connect with that individual and their family at that crisis opportunity. It is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity, and getting them into treatment. And treatment uh, means uh, immediately, that day or the next morning, not two weeks, not three weeks away, and, and ensuring that that person has the ability to negotiate into the treatment system. It, they, they get that assessment, they usually get MAT, medication assisted treatment, right away, and they are on the road to recovery immediately. Uh, that, that has been very promising in states like Rhode Island. We've actually seen a reduction in mortality rate in the past uh, in the CDC reports, which is very encouraging when we see that 
some of the activities that we're doing are actually turning to bending the curve of the mortality rate. The, the other area that we've already referred to is working with uh, persons that are coming out of prison, mm -hmm. uh, actively beginning treatment before they leave prison, ensuring that they have a treatment slot available in the community, they probably already have a relationship with a counselor and that they are uh, get the wraparound services they need for those immediately uh, following weeks and months that are extremely stressful mm -hmm. when they're readjusting to community life, family, employment, things like that, that they have a treatment team uh, that is going to help them uh, negotiate that and there's that, that part of their life is, is can be stable and that they are not at risk for overdose. Thank you, Spencer. When we return, we'll discuss how behavioral health institutions and the recovery community specifically are involved in the solution. Back in 2011, I found myself incarcerated in a jail in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I had been in and out of jail for the last several years as a direct result of my addiction to opiates, specifically with um, prescription pain medication. But in 2011, I found myself uh, once again sitting in a jail cell, withdrawing uh, from opiate withdrawal. And right then and there, I, I knew I had to make a decision. I, I needed to, you know, make some changes in my life. And I, I didn't like the way I was feeling. I didn't like the person who I had become. I, I called out to my higher power and I said, you know, I need to be free from this addiction. I, I need to do something different with my life. Starting on that day, I just started to make a plan um, what I wanted to do when I got back out to society. While I was at intensive outpatient program, I started to make a plan for myself. And one of the challenges that I had at the time was that I didn't have any formal education. So I said to myself, you know, step one should be um, not only to start to overcome my o opiate addiction, um, but to do something around uh, my education. And I said to myself, you know, I, I would also like to be a social worker at some point. And so I am currently enrolled working on um, obtaining my master's in social work at Wana University. So I currently work at Mental Health Partnerships on a CABI grant funded by SAMHSA through the state. Um, the program that I work on is um, to benefit chronically homeless individuals in the city of Philadelphia, uh, some of whom are challenged with substance abuse, psychological distress, and mental health challenges. Um, it's amazing work, very rewarding work. Um, been able to learn a lot about the um, homeless population in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and I'm excited about my work. Um, feel good about my work. Feel like I'm making a difference in the city of Philadelphia and in the life of others. Making just one connection during recovery from mental and substance use disorders can put the strength of family and community behind you. We're all connected, offering encouragement, support, and hope. Join the Voices for Recovery. Strengthen families and communities. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referrals for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HEALTH. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks for joining us again. During this segment of the panel, we'd like to focus on what are some evidence-based treatments that are out there and available for opioid use disorder and specifically, uh, I'd like to kick off by focusing on what's known as medication-assisted treatment. And I wonder, uh, Spencer, if you might take a moment and enlighten us on what MAT is all about. Sure. Medication-assisted treatment is using one of three FDA-approved medications, those being methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, to assist a patient in, uh, in their recovery. Uh, Medication-assisted treatment includes psychosocial treatments and recovery support, so it's really a three-pronged effort. The medication uh, allows a person to begin to experience recovery when they're not experiencing cravings and withdrawal effects and really able to begin to focus on other life skills. Mm -hmm. The psychosocial supports help them do that, and the recovery supports are going to be a lifelong challenge for that individual to, to have the supports to continue a life of sobriety. Evan, I understand there's some misconceptions out there in the community, uh, particularly the recovery community around MAT and is it really sobriety? And, and I wonder if you might dig into that question a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I do believe there's some stigma associated with the use of medication-assisted uh, treatment uh, as a pathway to recovery. Um, some individuals um, do not believe that people are fully in recovery as a result of being on 
medication assisted treatment. However, I would I would say that I've um, witnessed many of my peers um, succeed and thrive in recovery as a result. And the data shows it, right? The research shows that medication assisted treatment um, works. So Absolutely. yeah, so there's a lot of stigma. Uh, we need to, you know, inform. Every, everything's in the education, right? We need to educate individuals of how effective medication assisted treatment truly Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Now that we're more informed and insightful about how we address these problems, how do we uh, instill this knowledge uh, among our treatment providers out there? And what are some ways that behavioral health treatment providers can provide a multifaceted or comprehensive approach to help all who come in their doors with opioid use disorders? We, I have a university in my, in, my, in my city, Marshall University. We have medical school, pharmacy school, nursing programs, physical therapy school. Frankly, it starts there. Mm -hmm. um, what we've been able to do is involve them in all aspects. First, uh, with the SAMHSA grant, uh, just being able to train every healthcare professional and student um, on the early indication signs of, uh, of addiction. Uh, if, if a medical professional is able to identify the markers right up front, then they might be able to, in their treatment on other maladies, be able to make sure that they're avoiding going down another path that could lead to addiction. So that mm -hmm. would be step one. Then beyond that, then you start working your way into the medical community. Even though the opioid crisis is new and um, at a scale that we haven't seen with some other um, public health crises, the challenge with addiction and substance abuse problems is, is not new. And there's a lot that we do know that we can apply to this crisis. And one of the things that's important in terms of building public-private partnerships and building community-based approaches is the role of the faith-based communities. Mm -hmm. um, there's some you know, long history and tremendous work through, um, through churches and other faith-based organizations, again, close to the ground, close to, mm -hmm. uh, close to people. And so um, these are some of the things that we're looking at as well in terms of building those partnerships and, and outreach to individuals who are struggling. We've heard that uh, wide distribution of naloxone, more detox beds, those are the kinds of things that can help us address folks who are falling through the cracks and not making it to the front door of the treatment program. So um, one thing to be aware of is that not everybody is ready or nor willing to um, accept substance use treatment at this time. Um, however, um, that doesn't necessarily mean, mean that they need to die, right? Um, we need to keep them alive long enough. Um, so I did serve on the uh, mayor's um, task force to um, address the opiate epidemic in Philadelphia, a city that has seen 1,200 preventable deaths mm. um, in the year of 2017. Um, the city has um, done a good job at um, distributing uh, 20,000 um, sets of uh, naloxone, which is you know one of many name brands. Um, in fact, two weeks after I was trained on, on, on the use of naloxone um, back in November, um, two weeks after that, I was on my way home, uh, commuting from work, mm. and I um, saw an individual motionless out on the street. Uh, my training kicked in, I dialed 911, I administered uh, a dose of naloxone, um, sure enough, by the time the EMT got there, this individual was back on his feet, um, and you know he gets to fight fight another day. And you know, and and to that I say, you know, the first step to enter recovery is staying alive, yeah. right? So like, if you're not alive, you can't enter recovery. Yep. Thanks so much for sharing that. This is not just a theoretical conversation. This hits home with all of us. It's happening with you right on the street. And if you don't mind uh, my asking you a follow-up question, sure. uh, you've shared that you're an individual with lived experience. Yes. We, uh, uh, Spencer has shared and uh, yes. others on the panel sure. that uh, folks with lived experience, uh, peers, uh, as right. we call them, are having tremendous success in intervening yeah. um, uh, with individuals who are kind of Absolutely. not quite there yet. Can Absolutely. you tell me a little bit more about your experience with that? Absolutely. So as a certified peer specialist, uh, we truly meet individuals who are at in their recovery um, or in, in their addiction, right? So sometimes that means meeting them um, boots on the ground right in the middle of the epicenter where the opiate epidemic is at. Mm -hmm. um, not only are we meeting individuals where they are at in their addiction or their recovery, we're also um, being included in, in not only being included but leading the conversation on the way we're going to shape policy uh, as far as um, substance use treatment. In fact, uh, another one of those recommendations that I mentioned earlier on is um, comprehensive, comprehensive user engagement sites. Um, 
also known as safe injection sites. So in Philadelphia, the city government is actually exploring a safe injection site. And from my perspective, my, for me, it's, um, I don't just wanna be there as a person lived, with lived experience. I also wanna bring the voice of the person um, who's in active addiction and help mm -hmm. amplify their voice. Because as we know, you know, sometimes they don't have the resources to make it downtown, to sit through a meeting, go into opiate withdrawal. So I gotta, um, you know, get crafty, use social media, et cetera, have them write a letter out and take it to the city government and other individuals that are actually creating policies that are gonna um, impact these individuals later on. But again, the first step to recovery is an individual staying alive. If you're dead, you can't recover. We didn't hone in um, uh, too much on detox beds. And what happens in a detox for the general public's knowledge? How does MAT get introduced in a detox? That kind of thing. I wonder if you might share. Well, I think we start out by saying that detox alone is not treatment. De yeah. Detox mm -hmm. is an invitation to treatment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an invitation for a person to get into uh, MAT or uh, other evidence-based care. Uh, it is the place where many people start, but uh, detox alone is not going to be a sufficient you know, recovery program for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we really believe that uh, MAT is, is an extremely effective method. That, that, as I mentioned before, there are three different drugs that can be used, and uh, people can experience uh, very quick uh, responses to that where mm -hmm. they are on the path to recovery almost immediately which is a really, really powerful change in their lives. To tie in what you're saying with this emphasis that we've had on community and treatment is I was fascinated to discover that, you know, I think we kind of have this image of MAT as being a quick fix and mm -hmm. going to your point about the stigma associated with it, that's where this emphasis on community comes in is that a person, person has to be committed to being embedded mm -hmm. in that treatment for a longer period of time. There's no quick fix to the solution either for the individual or for us as communities or even for us as a nation. We have to be all in and we have to have a comprehensive approach to it. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, strategies and resources and really hone in on what that whole framework looks like that includes prevention, upfront, and treatment, and recovery supports. Do a little bit of a deeper dive, okay? Thank you. Thankfully, I can share with you today about Project Lazarus and how it developed from a grassroots perspective to address the opioid situation from 14 years ago. In 2007, Wilkes County was the third worst county in the United States for overdoses from prescription medications. And it took a comprehensive community response engaging all the community sectors, and that's what our mission has been. Engage all population groups, every single age, and to reach the individual, we determined we needed to change the village. And that has been our plan and our mission ongoing, not only in Wilkes, North Carolina, multiple states, even in the military and tribal groups. I serve as the co-chair of the Project Lazarus Wilkes Youth Coalition. And that coalition is made up of different agencies and organizations in the community that work directly and indirectly with youth. And so we really try to target strategies and implement those in the community to reduce youth substance use. We do education with the middle and high schools. We go into their health classes or to assemblies and talk about um, prescription medication misuse and the dangers associated with that. And what it's enabled us to do is to reach the younger population in all of the schools, the uh, extracurricular activities, and families within Wilkes County. We have prevention teams in the middle schools and high schools. We include not just drinking and driving and smart decision making, but drug education around all substances. We focus on um, providing prevention activities around the use and misuse of drugs, alcohol, and opiates. We work really closely with the other four middle school counselors um, and with Project Lazarus to provide the most up-to-date information to our students to help them. We work with students to develop life skills um, those life skills include uh, peer selection, positive decision making, and marketing and advertising geared towards youth. Our youth need to be able to make independent decisions without having a parent or an adult 
um, around them. So they need to be able to make positive decisions when they're with their peers. Youth leadership is a huge component in opioid misuse prevention. By really giving those youth the leadership skills that they need, they can go out and make much more difference in their youth communities than we can as adults because youth really listen to fellow youth more than they listen to us. So if you can give them the leadership skills and help them kind of channel their passion for prevention, they can make a monumental difference in, um, in their school community. Many of our students are very aware of the problem. They've seen the impact personally. Um, and we address the, the issues in the community. We work on one-on-one -on -one with some students with the Department of Juvenile Justice. Intervention education is a little bit of intervention for some kids who have, may have already been caught using substances, but it's also um, a prevention to keep them from re-engaging in any of that behavior. You teach the students about the strategic prevention framework and you teach them about the best strategies. I've been on the prevention team since the beginning of the school year. Participating on the prevention team, we've made a video and we meet once a month to discuss prevention. Being on the prevention team does make me feel like I'm making a positive influence on my school. As we look at the lessons learned with Project Lazarus, it was evident that the entire community has to be engaged. This isn't just one group or one organization, it's the entire community. And if they have the tools and the resources to do that, then change can happen and we can turn and are turning the tide of the opioid epidemic. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father. A son. A daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness. A substance use disorder. With support from family and community, we, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the Voices for Recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The opioid crisis continues to worsen in the United States. In 2016, more than 11 million Americans misused prescription opioids, nearly 1 million used heroin, and 2.1 million people had an opioid use disorder. At the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, we've developed a five-point strategy to combat the opioid epidemic. The strategy aims to strengthen public health data reporting and collection, improve access to prevention, treatment, and recovery support services, target the availability and distribution of overdose-reversing drugs like naloxone, support cutting-edge research on pain and addiction, and advance the practice of pain management. SAMHSA is playing a lead role in implementing this strategy. We're using data from our National Survey on Drug Use and Health to track key national and state-level indicators of opioid misuse and addiction. We're overseeing the largest opioid grant program within HHS called the State Targeted Response to the Opioid Crisis Grants, which have so far provided nearly $500 million to support state efforts to improve opioid prevention, expand access to medication-assisted treatment, and build recovery support services in communities. In our new policy lab, we'll be working closely with states, our partner agencies, and stakeholders to identify what is working to reduce opioid misuse, addiction, and overdose, and quickly translate this research into practice in communities across the country. Here at SAMHSA, we work closely with other agencies within the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as with the White House and other departments to advance efforts to combat the opioid crisis. In addition, SAMHSA plays a critical role in coordinating the response with the states through funding and technical assistance. In fact, we recently announced a $12 million technical assistance award for our state targeted response grants, specifically focused on helping states implement high-impact, evidence-based interventions. Giving people access to information on treatment options is a key first step to entering treatment and recovery. Last year, SAMHSA launched a new online tool, Decisions in Recovery, Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder, which helps people with opioid use disorder learn about using medication-assisted treatment options to strengthen their recovery. SAMHSA's other new resource, a mobile app for providers, provides practitioners with effective evidence-based care for opioid use disorders. The app provides information on treatment approaches and approved medications, a buprenorphine prescribing guide, and other clinical support tools such as recommendations for working with special populations. SAMHSA is also looking for ways to support the use of technology and telemedicine to expand their reach to underserved areas. 
SAMHSA's Matt Padoa grant program helps states to improve access to opioid addiction treatment. Some states are using this funding to establish telehealth care in rural communities. There is great interest in exploring the potential of technology-assisted monitoring and treatment for high-risk patients and patients with the substance use disorder. SAMHSA is committed to working with our partners and patients in order to meet the needs of individuals with the substance use disorder and those living in long-term recovery. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey, Hi, Join the voices for recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. What are some programs and resources on opioid use disorder available from SAMHSA and other federal agencies for behavioral health practitioners, providers, and consumers. And so, Mayor Williams, I'd like to start with you. You had talked earlier a little bit about some of the strategies you're employing in terms of rapid response in right. your community. If we might hone in a little bit on, is there a use um, to pair emergency responders with uh, people who know a little bit about this, or what, what are you what are you doing well, with the emergency? Our, our, our quick response team yeah. actually does pair first responders. Um, with uh, behavioral health professionals. Can um, you tell me more about um, that? How does that work? Well, very specifically, somebody has an overdose within 72 hours, we make sure that we go to that, we identify where that person is and we go to them and uh, indicate to them, we helped you, um, you're doing okay, we're here to be able uh, to help you beyond this. We can help you with treatment. Um, we're having of those who we can find, about 35% of them mm -hmm. are going in into treatment. Um, that's, that's powerful. And what usually happens, and it's happened on several different occasions, that person usually has someone else there who is a user as well. And oftentimes we had somebody else say, well, can I go too? Mm -hmm. Which really starts to let us begin to feel that all this work that we've been doing, we're finally starting to turn the curve where we're actually going around the curve and actually getting on the right side of this. Spencer, I'd like to uh, turn to you on some of the things that are happening at SAMHSA and that you're aware of federally around the use of pain management uh, regulations that can help docs who are, who've been given a license to prescribe regulate their distribution a little bit more safely. Right. Well, the, the CDC came out with guidelines recently that have been promulgated across the country. And as uh, May Williams has mentioned, the training of professionals uh, in all aspects of this. But as you mentioned, most uh, physicians are able to prescribe. And, but they may not have received excellent training in their med school or, or post-residency practice in, in prescribing for pain. So there's a lot of effort going on across the country in training professionals and bringing guidelines to bear such that they are engaging in safer practices. They're more compassionate, looking at individuals that do cross over into the addiction area and getting those individuals into treatment. This is really, really important that there is uh, individuals who are legitimately experiencing both pain and addiction, and they need both, both kinds of care. Because we've kind of rolled out a number of different strategies that have been working, I'm going to give you the hard task here, uh, Dr. Yost, in, in terms of we've hit on some prevention strategies. We've hit on uh, some treatment strategies and some recovery, port, recovery support service strategies. Within that broad rubric, are there some things that you'd like to highlight that you think we're missing, that we'd be remiss if we didn't mention? Well, what if I mentioned some resources that the federal government Perfect. has that people can access so that they can kind of check out some things on their own. SAMHSA is part of the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, and um, HHS, is, as it's called. And HHS has a website that mm -hmm. is devoted to the opioid crisis, and there's a, there's a place on that website where you can put, type in your uh, area uh, zip code mm -hmm. and find resources that are near you. 
And then the White House also has a website called opioids.gov, which is mm -hmm. meant to give an overarching view of, of the three different uh, legs of the stool, the prevention, the decreasing supply, mm -hmm. and the recovery and treatment. So those are some resources where if people, going back to how we started, that there's an information underload, I would just challenge people to really become educated on this crisis, particularly parents, mm -hmm. as to um, there, there'll be resources available from SAMHSA and HHS and other places in the government of how parents can talk to their children and 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 reach out in the community and get involved and and I liked what Steve said that everybody's going to have a role and people are going to have different different parts of of this crisis that they'll plug into. There's a treatment locator guide that uh, that allows a person to receive or to seek behavioral health treatment by the zip code just like you mentioned. There are also enormous uh, publications that are free publications that are downloadable electronically or hard copies from SAMHSA. Everything from guides to, to parents, to treatment professionals, to patients themselves. There's a whole host of things that are available at the, at the tip of your fingers. Evan, what are some, in your experience, what are some other ways that we might be able to get folks with lived experience engaged in, in the solution here? So I believe that when we're um, shaping policies um, or when we're starting um, nonprofit organizations or, or treatment centers, I believe that um, people with lived experience and even people in addiction need to be part of the conversation right? We're in the development stage, um, in addition to um, having um, individuals with lived experience serving on the board of directors, right? Um, bringing that lived experience and, and just kind of um, being, being that, amp helping amplify the voice of the person mm -hmm. who's still out there um, struggling with substance use disorder. So absolutely, it's yes. kind of like what we're doing here today, right? I'm inviting someone with lived experience to be part of the conversation and, and help, you know, be also part of the solution. Absolutely. We've talked a, a bit about how helpful recovery coaches or peers, as we call them, folks with lived experience generally with opioid use disorder, can be helpful in intervening in the emergency department Absolutely. in other areas of the system. And I wonder if you might talk about, um, you know, I feel like we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. How do we get folks like that more involved? Absolutely. I, I believe that um, certified recovery specialists or other um, folks with lived experience with substance abuse, abuse and mental health um, challenges um, should be part of the discussion. Um, they should be at the table. Um, they should be, uh, you know, leadership and nonprofit. Um, and, and like myself, um, they should also be on the board of directors. So I serve on the board of directors on Pathways to Housing PA, and it's a wonderful learning experience for myself. And coming to events like this, you know, being part of um, panel discussions with experts um, and get, just having to, making sure that the, a uh, person with the lived experience, his voice is also at the table, and, and we're um, understanding that perspective as well from, from the person with the lived experience. What is some information that we can share with our loved ones? Because as Evan pointed out, we're all touched by this in our, within our own families. Uh, just about everyone knows someone who's got a problem or who's in recovery. Uh, what are the kinds of things you think we ought to be saying uh, in our families, in our uh, extended families, communities, faith-based institutions, et cetera? For, for the individual sitting at home watching this, right, for like the mother, the parent, the, the, the person who's ready to give up on their child, getting ready to give up on their spouse, I would say, don't give up on them, man. Hang in there. Yeah. My mother hung in there for me. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was today my wife, she hung in there for me. And that absolutely made the difference. That made a difference in my recovery that somebody was hopeful, mm -hmm. you know, and somebody believed in me even mm -hmm. when I didn't believe in myself. You understand what I'm saying? So just being hopeful and just hanging in there with somebody. I know it gets challenging. I know it gets tough. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that I would add, um, if, if you know somebody um, struggling with, with substance disorder, specifically with opiates, um, you know, I would, I would um, encourage you um, and plead with you to please go out and get uh, trained on, on the use of naloxone, one of many brands out there. Um, you know, that could literally mean the difference between life and death. In the palm of your hands, if somebody in your family, immediate family, or maybe even a neighbor, coworker is experiencing an opiate overdose. Any other final thoughts among our panelists? I just think, Evan, thank you so much for being willing to share your story because I think this is the most powerful part of our entire time here together is hearing your story and giving people hope. And, mm -hmm. you know, as policy people, we want to talk about the data. We want to look at the facts and the figures. But what really is going to make a difference is focusing on the stories of people like yourself who have persisted and who found a way out of addiction and into, um, into a more abundant life. And so I think that as we share those 
stories and encourage people who are struggling to come out from behind the shame, the stigma, and to, mm-hmm. and to reach out and to get the help. And by you giving them a hope and, and a way forward and knowing that there is um, an optimism out there, I think that's the most important thing. If there's anything that we can hold on to is knowing that everything that we're encountering and how we're learning in our communities to deal with this, there's a formula that I've worked in my mind that just, if we follow this, then we find ourselves on the successful side. Mm-hmm. If you're collaborating, talking with one another, you start to create partnerships. Mm-hmm. Collaboration and partnerships create trust. Collaboration and partnerships with trust establish hope. All of this becomes worth it because on the other side, we're a stronger community. That's what recovery is. Absolutely. And that makes our nation better. Mayor Williams, thanks so much for that message of hope. And, and uh, Spencer, I'd like to turn to you uh, as our SAMHSA official here today and, and just a final thought from you. Well, one of the words that SAMHSA talks about is, is treatment works. And we know that, that when people get access to high quality, effective treatment, that their lives can be changed. And, and one of our goals is to ensure that people get that access to treatment and that they can get on the road to recovery as soon as possible. This concludes today's episode of The Road to Recovery, focusing on the opioid crisis. I want to thank our panelists and all of our viewers and listeners for joining us. We've had a marvelous panel today, and I want to remind you to celebrate Recovery Month each September throughout the year. For more information, please visit Recovery Month website, and thank you for joining us today.